Welcome, our church family. My name is Pastor Tim Jorgensen. I'm here stepping in for, uh, for Pastor T.L. Sadler as they are on vacation. And uh, today I'm going to bring out a very special message, I believe, that is going to bless you. And I'm really lo looking forward to delivering it to you. And uh, it's something I like to call staying in your place of strength. Staying in your place of strength. So uh, let's start off with a familiar scripture, a familiar passage in Psalms 91, verse 1. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Key word is dwells. Dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So this week, unfortunately, um, or a couple weeks ago, by the time this airs, uh, there was a very tragic story. There is a Pennsylvania husband and wife uh, who are visiting uh, down in Florida for vacation. And unfortunately, they uh, were drowned due to the riptides down there in the, in the town where they were staying. They, uh, they got into a place where they thought they were relaxing, having fun, having a good time with their, with their family. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the red flags were out and they did not, get, whether they didn't pay attention, whether they didn't see them, I don't know. But they got into a place where uh, the, the tide just carried them out and unfortunately they drowned. Um, thankfully, their, their kids were able to um, uh, be away from those, those riptides where they, they were, were not affected, but it was a tragedy for their whole family. It's, it's something that happens every single year. They say uh, in the U.S. about 71 people every year on average uh, perish due to drowning due to riptides. It's, it's a sad phenomenon, but the, the point is that this occurs when people get into a place where they're relaxed, they're having fun, but they're not paying attention to where they're standing. They do not have enough strength to stay where they're at. They lose their place of strength. And oftentimes that we um, get into that place in life where we are not at our best, um, where out of sorts, we're not in the right frame of mind. Uh, it's when that happens, it's not usually great things. And sometimes we can just survive. We can basically get by. But sometimes words, thoughts, actions uh, come forth that we regret. Uh, the bad thing is when this state becomes a habit. Um, and that's why, as I start off in Psalms 91, uh, it, it says, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so this is where we want to be, is a place where we dwell, where it's a habit, where we, we dwell in this place of strength. So the key part of this verse, again, we, we, we know this verse, it's a very common verse, but the thing is, is dwells where? In the Most High. It, not, it doesn't say in the most high, it says dwells in the secret place of the most high. Well, that's a good question. This is a good question. What, who is this a secret to? Is it secret to you? Shouldn't be. Is, can you tell yourself a secret? You know, I'm gonna tell myself a secret. No, it's not a secret to you. Uh, secret place of the most high is, is it secret of God? Because God is like, oh, I didn't know you were there. Oh, you're holding a secret from me. Is it a secret of God? Who is it a secret to? It's a secret to everyone else. And why is it a secret? Because they don't see it. They don't perceive where you're dwelling. Even though it's your habit, it's still a secret. They can't see that that's your position of strength. So it can't, this is why it's important. It may be a secret to them, but it can't be a secret to God and it cannot be a secret to you. You have to know your place of strength. If you don't know it, if you don't know this position, this place of strength for you, then you are getting in a place where the riptides of life are going to put you in a disadvantage. And we do not want to be at a disadvantage in life. So Jesus, even though he was the son of God, he was, he was God, uh, came forth in the flesh. 
he also, he knew his, his place of strength and he made it make sure to protect it. You could see when he was 12 years old that he made it a point to be around the teachers. He made a point to say, you know, ask questions, to get strengthened in his own knowledge of God, his own knowledge, of, which is kind of a mystery, but he, he says, don't you know, I had to be about my father's business. That was where he, he dwelled. Uh, as he as he got older, he, again, even though he was baptized uh, in in power and the Holy Spirit, and he knew exactly who he was as the, the the Son of God, he knew what his purpose was. He still got away. He got away where he and early in the morning he would get away with uh, with God in prayer. He'd go on the top of a, of a mountain late at night. So there's there's different times of the day where he would he would sneak away with with his father just to commune and to get get guidance get direction, get strength. I don't know everything that he got from them, but eventually his disciples came to him and said, teach us how to pray. There's something about your place of strength, the way you connect with God that we need to know. How do you connect with God the way you do? Teach us the same way, how to pray, how to communicate, how to, how to flow in that, that position of prayer. And that, that, that's, uh, so Jesus knew and he never, he never forgot about it. He, he, it was constantly on his mind of where he was. As, as he said, it says, when your eye is single, his body, your body is full of light. And so when your eye is single, your vision is clear of where you're standing, that's where you're going to be your strongest. That's where we're going to have the most security in your life. Jesus knew, and we also have to know where we dwell, where we stay in. What is that position of strength to you? Where are you at your best? Where are you at your strongest? So I'm going to talk about two aspects, two aspects of this, uh, of what this place of strength is and what this represents to us. Um, number one, it's position. So if you're writing something down, write down, you have to know your position, that your place of strength depends on position. Uh, your, and that basically is your place in him. When you are in Christ, you are a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come. You have to know the in him scripture, scriptures of who you are in Christ. You are the righteousness of God in him, that you have an inheritance in him, that you have a place before the throne of God in him. In Christ is your, is your righteousness, your strength, your redemption, that you are in him, you are, you are secure and stable in him. It's not because of you. It's not because of what others have done. It's not because of what the decisions your parents make, but it's because your faith, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You have to know your place in him. It's in him and that's, that you rely on, you depend on, you focus on. So why is this important? Because uh, if you don't know your position, uh, you, it can lead you to some bad places. And, and so Adam, he got out of position because it wasn't on his mind. It wasn't on his mind. Remember, we're transforming the renewing of our mind. We have to, we have to get renewed to the position that our, our spirits are at in him. So that's where we're seated. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So the Bible says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So Adam, even though when he was created, it says here in Genesis 126, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. So these are things that God spoke, spoke over Adam, that Adam, you were created in my image, according to my likeness. And so, and I'm going to give you dominion, dominion over the, the birds, the fish, the cattle, the earth, all, all these other things. That was Adam and Eve's, mankind's position position. But you know the story? The serpent deceived them. And he, when he came, he, he deceived them into thinking that they were not made in the image of God. That was the thing that, that, was, that was missing uh, from their mind. It's like uh, where the serpent talked to Eve, he says, yeah, God doesn't want to eat, eat this fruit. He says, because if you know if you eat of this, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. They were already like God. They were already made in his image. So he was trying to sell them something that they already had. It's like selling ice to an Eskimo. Why would you do that? So that's what, what uh, the serpent was doing to Eve, selling ice to an Eskimo. And Eve said, well, okay, well, it's, 
uh, I want to be like God. She had a desire. That was her heart. She, it was a good desire. Like, I want to be like God. No one could, they all, but they already knew it. He, she, they lost what they already had. They lost what they already had because they, it was left the, her mind. It left her mind, even though she had it, but she forgot. Isn't it a shame when you have this something, but you just forget where it is? You know, ever like sunglasses, it's like, why was my sunglasses? It's on your head and you're searching every, you're wasting time looking for those, but they're sitting right on your head. Um, you're looking for your keys, but they're in your pockets. It, it wastes time and it, you look foolish in the end. Now those are silly, but here it was, it, it caused a, the sin of all, for all mankind because she forgot who she was. Adam forgot who he was. And because they, they uh, were searching for something they already had and they just didn't, they didn't know it, they didn't mind it. And they listened to someone who, who was able to snatch away from them. It's a horrible, it's a horrible thing. And so, uh, again, it wasn't a sin for getting their position. That's very important. It wasn't a sin for getting their position. But not knowing their position led them into a place of acting in sin, missing the mark. So Ephesians 4, 27, it says, it says, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. There's a place you have that you can actually give up to, to the enemy. And, and, so, and you don't want to give that enemy your, the, your position. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, uh, Paul was writing, it says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, if we are not ignorant of his devices. The context of that was, is in forgiveness, learning to forgive. That if you, if you don't forgive, that the enemy can take advantage of, of, of you. But the point here is uh, we do not want Satan to take advantage of us. That we, he, the enemy has to take advantage from us. It's not something that, that he automatically has. It's something he has to take from us. We have an advantage. We have a position. We have a place of strength. And so the key is not to give up our advantage. Well, you're like, well, I'm so, I, I'm so tough. I'm so strong. I, I, I can get comfortable. Don't just keep your advantage. The Bible says that, that, that we are to keep the enemy under our feet. We have to keep him under our feet. He always tries to rise up. Keep him down there. Keep him down there. Don't let him just, don't let up on it. You don't, if you let him take advantage um, that with his devices, we are going to be in a lot of trouble. We have a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, and it's going to lead to some horrible things. Another, another great uh, scripture, which is actually a very sad scripture, but it illustrates the point perfectly. Second Samuel verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse one, it, it says here, uh, it happened the spring of the year. So talk about David. You know, David's the model. He was a great uh, warrior, great king, uh, man after God's own hearts. But after he got, he fulfilled a lot of his prophecies. He got into a place of, of where he was the king, where he had authority. And he, he, a lot of things were going well for him. However, he got a little comfortable. Look here. Uh, it says here, verse one, it happened the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab, his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. So it's a time when the kings go out to the war. But David said, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable here. I'm fighting's hard. Uh, you know, I worked hard for this. Let me just relax here. And his, his getting out of position, out of doing his high calling. The Bible says that we're supposed to press on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that was part of his calling is he was to take territory and be involved with that. He was the warrior king, uh, the, the person that, that uh, was executing God's laws uh, in, 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 in fulfilling and taking the, the territory that, that uh, was lost over time. And he just, he stepped back from that. And so what, what happened, uh, again, his position was not a sin, but being out of position led to a, acting in sin. And you guys know the story. You know what happened. You know, he was on the roof. He saw Bathsheba, um, and which led to uh, adultery, 
which led to killing uh, Bathsheba's husband, and then which led to the, the, the child dying, which led to uh, it, this adultery getting sown, this immorality and sown to his family, where it led to uh, his, one of his oldest sons committing rape, where one of his younger sons uh, com uh, committing treason and trying to overtake his throne, which led to a division of the country. It, it led to a whole big curse over the nation because of one thing. He got a position. Instead of going out to war, it led this chain reaction that shattered the country. And, he had to, and uh, God had mercy on him. He asked for mercy. He received mercy. And, and, and again, David sowed some great seeds, which, which, uh, and he turned toward God, which would salvage the situation. But the, sal the situation was in a place of disarray, and it caused a lot of pain to a lot of people because he got up out of position. We all have these stories, unfortunately, where we get out of position and we're, our, we're not in the right frame of mind, we're not in the right place, and it hurts ourselves and many others. And it's because the enemy takes advantage. He takes advantage. He says, you're not in a position, you're not, you're not, you're not acting as you should, you're not uh, pr uh, praying with the, with the right frame of mind, you're not uh, um, holding the enemy under your feet, you're not walking in faith as you should, and you get out of position. Again, we're not, we're not condemning anyone. God's goodness, his mercy lasts forever. And the purpose of this message is to keep your position of strength. Get, if you, if you sat down, stand back up, get to that place once more that you, that you once had, you once knew you had, get to that place. If you're in that place, strengthen it, strengthen your position there. Uh, don't let, don't let, uh, let up on it when, cause when the time comes, when the time comes where you got to speak that word, where you got to pray that certain scripture, when you, when you have to minister in that, in that uh, environment, when you have to say those things that it's going to make a difference for yourself and others, you are poised, you are ready to act. You're ready to act. So uh, another example, Moses. Now this is a good example. Moses, when he was uh, uh, fighting the Amalekites, Exodus 17, verses 9 through 13. It says here, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when it down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So this is an example of Moses staying in his position, staying in his place of strength, because the whole battle depended upon him staying in that position, staying in that place where he was strong and where he, he was, he, the, the victory was held up, the position of victory, the, the promise was held up that, that God would fight for us, God would fight for your enemies, God would fight against your enemies for you. And so the victory did not depend, did not depend on Joshua uh, and the men Joshua chose. The vic victory, even though they were a part of it, but ultimately the victory depended on Moses staying in his position. We may not help staying in our position in the midst of the battle. So if you have people around you that can remind you of who you are, remind you of your place in God, who can, who, can, who can tell you the truth of who you are in Christ, remind you of your calling. What are you called to do? And speak the, the truth of what God says about you all over you. And speak those truths of your position in him. If you have people around you who can hold up your hands in that way, hold up, and the, and the hands has to do a, a mental thing. It's, it's a mental uh, position of holding up that banner of victory. Verse 15, and Moses built an altar there 
and call its name, the Lord is my banner. And so a banner is a, is a banner of victory. So that's what it represents. So usually you place your banner after you take the land. You, you, you see these monuments um, of the wars that people fought. When they take the hill, they plant the flag there um, and say, hey, we've taken the land. It's, we've, won the, we've won the victory. But God says here, he wants you to know the secret of victory, the secret of the dwelling place of the Most High. He says, if you, if you keep holding up the banner, that's the promise of victory. Now, faith is some of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is saying, I believe in for the victory is one, that God's promised me a position of victory. I, God's promised I'm going to come through this. I'm holding up my promise. I'm not I, I'm getting help holding up my hand like I'm holding, no matter what I feel like, no matter what it seems like, I'm holding up the promise of God's position me to win, position me to victory, position me. And, and as it says, you will reap if you faint not, if you don't lose hearts. You, you'll reap if you don't lose hearts. And the heart is holding on to that promise, the promise of victory. God has promises for you. And so your enemy not know it. Your, the other people may not know it, but God knows it and you must know it. That's, that's where that banner of victory is like, I know I've won my victory. And so the key is, you're, and this is the, the key uh, phrase you want to remember, you, you're not fighting for victory, you're fighting from victory. You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. God in God's made you a conqueror in Christ. He says in all these things, in all these things, we not will be more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We are. And that's that promise, that promise of victory. So don't fight for victory, fight from victory. So your mind is settled on who you are in Christ. And again, it doesn't matter what the feelings are. It doesn't matter what the situation is. And I know it, it, it seems like a mantra. It seems it's said over and over again. But you can't judge truth based on feelings. You can't judge truth based on obstacles. You can't judge truth based on what other people say. You can only base truth on what God has said. And if you put your faith in the truth and what God has said, it can carry you through. But you have to get grounded in that truth. You have to get grounded in that, that confidence of what his promises are. So uh, sometimes it takes a song to do it. Sometimes it, 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 it takes a, a prayer. Sometimes it takes a confession. Um, I, I, just a, a week ago, we're singing in praise and worship. It's, it's, we're singing about, um, we sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's not a worship song, okay? That's not a worship song. You're not praising God when you sing that. What you are is it's a, it's a declaration of what God has said about you. It's, it's again speaking your song yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's a way of being getting filled with the spirit is by speaking the truth about what God says about you. And it's it's a way of confession. It's about putting your mind on those things. Now that's not you 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 have to when you sing it, you have to meditate on that. You can't just sing it just syllables and, and, and harmonize. It has to be a mental imagination of what uh, and that declaration of the truth of, of God in that situation. And because of that, you act a certain way. Because of that truth that you sung, you live a certain way. Um, so we have to get it settled. Get that position settled. No wavering. So when it's settled, you have to be able to enforce that against the enemy of what the truth says. Know your position in Christ. In preparing this, there was a story that, that God brought up. And, and I just want to share this to you. It's, it's from his, his book, um, I Believe in Visions, of Kenneth Hagin. And Kenneth Hagin has, has, it's a great book. And so there, in this, there was a vision, and again, it's part of a larger vision, but um, uh, there was a, a little demon 
that ran between Kenneth Hagen and, and Jesus was talking to Kenneth Hagen and a little demon ran in between and started creating this, this cloud. And so the demon was yelling and Kenneth Hagen couldn't hear Jesus because of this, this, this loud yelling, 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 yelling. And so he, he, Kenneth Hagen was confused. Like, why, why is Jesus continuing to talk? Doesn't he, can't he see this demon? Can't he see what this, this spirit is doing that I can't hear him? And he's like, why doesn't he do something about this, this spirit, this evil spirit? Why doesn't he do something about this? And so finally, in desperation, Kenneth Hagin commanded the, the, the demon to be quiet in the name of Jesus Christ. He says, be quiet. And the, the, instantly the demon dropped to the floor and started whimpering. And the smoke, all the smoke screen just disappeared. And the demon just lay there whimpering. And then uh, I can't take any command the demon to go and just scampered away. So in this vision, Kenneth Hagin was, was wondering, it's like, why Jesus did not stop that evil spirit and from interfering? I mean, obviously he knew this was happening. Why didn't he stop it? And Jesus knew what Kenneth Hagin was thinking. He says, if you had done something about that, I couldn't have. And so Kenneth Hagin says, I think I just misunderstood you. Um, you said you couldn't do anything about it, but I, 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 but you really, what you really meant says you wouldn't do anything about it. He says, no, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. And Kenneth Hagin, he says, but Lord, you can do anything. Obviously, we, and we believe this. You can do anything. To say you couldn't is different than anything I've ever preached or heard preached, and it just really upends my theology. And the Lord said, sometimes your theology needs upending. And Jesus taught him that nowhere in the New Testament is a believer told for God to do something about the devil for them. Let me say it again. Jesus taught him that nowhere in the New Testament is a believer told to pray for God to do something about the devil for them. The believer is always taught, told to take authority over the devil. You've been given authority. You have to use it. God's not going to use what he gave, put in your hands to use. Again, God didn't tell you know, lift up the rod of Moses for him. You see this throughout the whole Bible. Honestly, if you take a look, God doesn't just do things for you. There's always the human partnership. If you, if you do this, he will, God does this. It, is, is that it works hand in hand. It works together. And so, the kind of thing is like, I, I just don't, I, I, I can't, you're, you're going to have to show me from the Bible about this. And so, uh, he, he walked the scriptures in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, uh, Mark uh, 16, 17, uh, James 4, 7, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, Ephesians 4, 27. These are all scriptures where God told the believer to, that they've been given authority to, because they have authority, they can do something. They are meant to do something about that. And so that was, uh, again, that, that seems... Very counter, like we know God is almighty, all powerful, but we have to take our position that he gave us. Goes back to Adam and Eve. When the serpent came to the garden, God didn't just come in and just like, pop, smack the serpent, says, shut your, your dirty mouth, you know, get out of here. So he didn't do that. It was up to Adam and Eve to use the authority, the position that was given to them. God didn't tell, to, didn't tell uh, David, he says, get on the battlefield. Here, you're in the wrong position. I'm going to pick you up and put you over there and, and put you back on the battlefield. He didn't, he didn't prevent uh, David from getting out of his position. Now, I, I know God in his mercy, he is so good. And there's many times he will remind us, he works with us. He, he, will, he will do everything he can to, by the Holy Spirit to whisper us, to remind us, to stay in our position. But being out of position is not sin. But being out of position will lead to a place of acting in sin. 
And that's where we have to come to a place where we have to take responsibility to stay in our place of strength. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, you guys know this scripture. Finally, my brethren, again, this is the end of, end of Ephesians. It's talking, if you look at, read through the book of Ephesians, it talks a lot about our position, a lot about the things that God has already done for us in Christ. It says here, Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, upon the whole armor of God, that you may both stand against the wiles of the devil. For do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Verse 13. And, and, and well, before I get there, it, who is God doing the wrestling or are we doing the wrestling? It's not God. It's us. We are the ones supposed to be doing the resisting. We are the ones supposed to do this. He's not fight. I know we'd say God fights our battles for us. But if we don't get into our position in him, he can't fight through us. He wants to fight through us. This is the word of God. This is what the Bible is. I, I know we want to take a back seat and let Jesus take the wheel. But there are times we have to rise up from our position and take the authority that God's given us, take our place of strength and act from there. He's not going to take the wheel from us when he said, get in the driver's seat and drive. I will provide the car. I will provide the power. I, but you have to use what I've given you. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Having done all to stand. What does that stand? It, it's, it doesn't mean like you're trying to take the mountain. You're already positioned in heavenly places. You are on top of the mountain. It's the enemy is trying to creep up. He's trying to take your position from you. And that's where you have to, you have to uh, again, it goes to the armor of God. And we talk about armor of God is like, it's, it's a mental thing. You have to put on the breastplate, put on the shield, put on the, those are not, those are not things you put on. Those are things that you meditate on and get strong on. Get strong in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Get strong in faith. Get strong in truth. Get strong in the gospel. Get strong in salvation. Get strong in the sword of the spirit, the word of God. You get strong in those things because these things are your position that you have to stand in. I'm standing in my righteousness. I'm standing in the truth. I'm standing in faith. I'm standing in the gospel. I'm standing with salvation. I am saved. I am saying no matter what the enemy says, bombards my mind, I am saved. So it's not just talking about these things. It's knowing the reality of the position that you've been given with those, with those pieces of armor. Because the enemy wants to take every piece of those armor. If he can take those, those armor, get you out of position, get out of your place of strength, get you out of your righteousness, get you out of faith, get you out of salvation. If he can get those things off, then he can take your goods. They can take your goods. Look here at Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Uh, I love the book of Nehemiah. It's, it's a great book. It's, it's a great picture about how, the, how God wants us to work and how the enemy works um, to try and stop us. Uh, it, again, you can see that the, the city of Jerusalem was broken down. The walls were broken down. Nehemiah had a, had a passion. says, this is cities unprotected. It, it does, it's not, it's precarious in its position. We have to rebuild the wall. And so the enemy is like, I want to be able to attack anytime I want to. I, I don't want this, this city to be in a position of strength. If it's in a position of strength, we're in trouble. And so look at the Nehemiah's, his focus to, to strengthen his position of strength. Mm, strengthen his position strengthen his position. And so verse, chapter six, it's a very interesting one. Now it happened, uh, verse one, now it happened when Simbalat, Tobiah, Gisham, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I, talk, this is no Nehemiah talking, that I rebuilt the wall and that there was no breaks left in it. Isn't that awesome? Hey, that, that's his focus. No breaks left in the wall. Even though at that time I not hung the doors and the gates. That Simbalat and Gisham 
uh, sent to me saying, come, let us meet among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you? And they sent me this message four times. And I answered them in the same manner. Awesome. I love this. So Nehemiah, he was, he was told, says, you know what? Come down from the wall. Come out of your place of position. Come out of your place of strength. Come into a place and just, we need, we need to discuss some things with you. The enemy wanted to, want, want you, him to come to them. And so oftentimes that's what the enemy says. And he comes through, uh, through friends, through family, through enemies, through workplace. Through, says, you know, come into a place of worry. Come into a place of fear. Come into a place of, of, of uh, accusation, of, of discontent, of jealousy, of envy. Come down and come in and fight at this level. And so and it's, that place is a valley, a plain of oh no. And so do not come down to the worry, to the doubt, to the fear. Don't meet there. Don't leave your position straight to come to go there. And so if he would have left his position, he would have left his place of protection. I know we want to have compassion on people. I know we want to weep with those who weep. I know we want to just have a, um, a sense of um, like-mindedness where we understand the weaknesses people go through. But they're also, we have to draw a line that says, I can't come to a place of weakness. I can't come to a place where I'm denying the word of God. I, I have to stay in my place of strength. I can't, if there's bad things happen, I can't come to a place of complaining. Complaining is a confession of powerlessness. That's why the, God hates complaining so much because it is a confession that God can't do anything. God is not in the place where he can help you. Complaining brings you out of position. Fear gets you out of position. Worry gets you out of position. And, and so there, we saw this in, in the scriptures, how Jesus handled that. You know, when, when the 12-year-old girl was was sick, she died, and all the people were in, the, in the room in the house, weeping, complaining, and, and, and crying. And so, and Jesus said, "No, she's not dead. She's just sleeping." And they laughed him to scorn. He's he's like, "Okay, I'm I'm trying to give you a place of faith because if, if sleeping people can be woken up, but if you're not going to believe me, I need you out, 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 out." So God. All, the, all those complaining people, all those weeping people, all those people in despair and worry out of the room. And then he was able to work with, with his three of his key disciples and just said, little girl, arise. And that situation was turned around because he would not tolerate that. I know it seems like it is lack of compassion, but if he was going to stay in his place of strength, what he knew he had to do, he had to make a decision that he was going to act in such a way where he could not tolerate fear, worry, despair, depression. He could not tolerate it because then he couldn't do what he knew God could do. So Paul, you know, Paul also, when he, he was at a place where he was, had to go to Jerusalem and they said, oh, you know, don't go, you know, bad things are going to happen to you. He says, why are you trying to weep? Why are you trying to break my heart? I know what I'm called to do. And this is the next level where I'm supposed to testify before kings. He says, I'm not, I'm not only willing to be in prison. I'm willing to die for the, Christ, for the cause of Christ. He says, why are you weeping and trying to break my heart? He had to, you know, weep with those who weep, Paul. You said so. You know, weep with those who weep. This is a place where you are not weeping um, with, out, of, out of compassion. You are, you're weeping out of out of fear, out of what's the source? What is the source? You can weep out of compassion where you're, you're, you're trying to do something to, to help. But if you're just, if you're in a place of like uh, sorrow and worry and it, it will break, a broken spirit can dry the bones. I, I was, I heard, heard a scripture preach this, this week. It says um, from Proverbs, a strong spirit will sustain someone in from you, but a broken spirit drives the bones. That's so true. And so you have to, you have to be aware of what, where, what keeps you in a, a place of strength. What keeps you in a place of strength? So I'm almost done here. 
So it, it, it says, so we, again, we can't focus on the sufferings. We got, we got to resist the enemy steadfast in faith. What do you believe that God's going to do because of that prom, his promise? So the next, so I talked about position, knowing your position. Second place is your flow. So if you look outside right now and here in Wisconsin, it, it, there's a lot of rain. I know throughout the country, there's, there's a lot of rain. It's, and so the beautiful thing is that there's lots of things that are green, growing, flourishing. I, I know the farmers are happy. Again, you don't want too much rain, but, but we, everything's green and growing. And why? Because of the water, because of the water. Uh, what, what's great about the water? It carries nutrients where they need to go. It carries waste away. And this represents the flow of the spirits. Again, the point one, number one, is position your place of strength is a position and your your place of your your uh, place of strength is also a flow position and flow position and flow and so the flow of the spirit helps you in terms of it it uh, brings nutrients to you and carries waste away carries nutrients to you uh, carries waste away this place of strength is not does not equal uh, a static like a static is just a statue in a position. You no, know, there's flow. You're a, this position is you meant to grow in that position. You're a tree planted by a, by living water. You're taking in the nutrients. You're producing fruits. There is a flow, and and so Second uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen verse fourteen it says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So that's where he ends Second Corinthians chapter thirteen. So this communion of the spirits be with you all. Communion means to flow back and forth, back and forth. It's a communion. It's it's a sharing of life, and so that flow of the spirit again, it's like water. So the kingdom of God is like a seed. All right, that seed equals the kingdom of God, the call of God. The, the thing where, where the dominion of God is exercised in the earth. So the seed, once it's positioned in the ground, it's positioned properly, a flow needs to happen to that seed for life to break out. Okay? That's why the water is very important. It, 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 somehow it unlocks something within the seed. It may be positioned correctly. But it has to have a flow for life to break out. So, and that seed, where when it's starting to grow, it again, it's it, Jesus is very plain. It's like the seed goes into the ground and it dies. It no longer is a seed. It transforms. It it, it breaks out, and it's uncomfortable. When we are we're we're growing, it's. It's not comfortable. It stays hard. And so unique gifts are birthed in various environments. So you ever see that guy on, on YouTube with the, he has the, um, uh, he, he talks about how to plant different types of seeds. Um, uh, he's in TikTok, I guess as well, but um, he says, you know, here, watch this. You know, you, you want, don't throw this away, plant it here. And he, he goes through all this whole, uh, rigmarole and he, all these different seeds grow in different environments. And so we also, we flow and we grow in different environments. So, uh, and the first step uh, where that, that seed breaks out, it, it doesn't end there. That's, that, that's where it kind of starts. So after it grows in one place, he transferred it into another place and that's where it actually starts bearing fruit. So what, there could be certain uh, places we go in terms of like a, a gifting, a calling, a, a church meeting. A, um, uh, we read a certain type of book or uh, we hear a certain type of a message or watch a certain type of video and something comes alive inside of us. That seed starts, that, that God's plans inside of us starts to, to burst forth. And, but then it has to be planted in a, another place where it has to be fed. It has to be, the nutrients have to grow. So that's where that flow has to be continued. So what happens in that place of, of that flow, that place of strength? That's where your faith starts growing in that calling, in that, that word that God's given you. God starts to speak to you in that place, that environment. Um, your sight 
what you, your vision for your life for what you can do in, in that position gets clarified. The enemy is stripped off. The enemy that tries to hold on to you and, just, and contain you get, gets stripped off. So there's two levels where this flow happens, two levels. Number one, um, you have to um, kind of create or go to your environment that refreshes and resources you. So this could be, you could be in the midst of listening to worship music. Again, you read the right book. You listen to a certain preacher. Um, you watch the right kind of video. You have a certain type of friends. You, there's an environment around you um, where things start to grow. Again, go to church. If you're just sitting here, at, you know, watching uh, Pastor Tim on, on video, um, that's awesome. But you need to go to church. You need to get in a place of, with a body of believers where things can be fed and, and you can be planned, you can grow, which is awesome. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, uh, Paul says this. And again, this is the great apostle Paul. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. This is a place where, where Paul, again, he was an amazing minister of the gospel, but the door was opened by the Lord, but because he had the right environment the right people around him, he had to leave. He says, this is not good. Even though God opened a door, God has a seed for me to plant. I can't do it because the, my environment is not correct. You have to get the, you have to create that, that right environment. Um, Saul, in the, he was in the company of the prophets. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden he started to prophesy. Right environment, certain gifts start to, start to flow. Um, there was a prophet that when they were wondering whether to attack a, a certain army. Um, and so he says, yeah, we'll call for a minstrel. And the minstrel started to play, and then he started to prophesy. So D Saul, when he was being tormented by an evil spirit, he called David to, to play, the, play and worship God, and the evil spirit left. Certain people, certain things can create certain environments where the right things can grow. I know various times in my life where, because with the teaching gift, the gift was stirred up when I was like, I was working out, I was listening to, to teaching, to, to Christian music. Um, and all of a sudden I just started getting visions of things that God wanted me to do. And my gifts started getting stirred up. Um, I would go to one, sometimes I would go to Kenneth uh, Copeland Believers Conventions and I would just sit there taking notes. All of a sudden my mind started buzzing because, and my spirit just started coming alive because all, and all this revelation that comes to me, and it wasn't necessarily what they were teaching. It's, I was in the environment of the teaching gift and it starts speaking to that teaching gift inside of me. And it just started getting stirred up over and over and over again. And just because it, it just fed what was inside of me. And so what, there could be things with you. What is, what is the thing that stirs you up? When you get when you get a certain environment, when you when you go to church, when you hear a certain message, when you hear a certain song, uh, what gets stirred up inside of you? Maybe there's a certain uh, ministry gift that you get around, and all of a sudden, like, I can do this. I can do this. Uh, what, what was it? Uh, I believe it was. Um, uh, um, oh, what was that what was that great evangelist? Uh, went to went to India. Um, uh, Oh, I forget his name, but it was a, the great evangelist that went to India, um, uh, Osborns, the Osborns. Um, uh, yeah, with um, T.L. Osborne. I should have forget. T.L. Sadler, T.L. Osborne. Anyways, uh, T.L. Osborne, Daisy Osborne. He was, he was sitting in the back and, and listening to uh, either William Branham or uh, I, I believe, yeah, I believe it was William Branham. He was sitting in the back and God said to him, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. And, and, and it's from, from that, something inside of him got stirred up. And he's like, I'm going to go preach the gospel and, and be an evangelist overseas. And it's because he was in a right place where the right seed could grow up. So that level, that's level one, where you're around uh, in an environment where things get stirred up, and that's very good. Level two, you stir yourself up. 
Paul told Timothy, he says, you meditate on the gift that was that's in you. It says you can stir up the gift by meditation, by meditating on the gift that's been given to you. So as you, you meditate on the gift, meditate on the word of God, you speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, uh, making melody in your heart to the Lord. You sing in the spirit, you pray in the spirit, you build yourself up on your most holy faith, being still, listening. See, this is where all those other things that stir you up, you, where you create an environment, other things feed you, and the baby inside you starts to leap, like John the Baptist leapt in the womb when, when Mary spoke to him, uh, spoke, spoke to Elizabeth, that something caused your baby to leap in the womb. So in the same way, when uh, um, you can get in an environment where things start to jump inside of you, but it's even better when you can start to stirring, speaking to your gift and stirring it up. So not you're, when you're not relying on an outside influence, you're not relying on an outside influence. So it's just you, your spirit, God, that's all you need. That's all you need. That's level, that's level two. This is where, what made David strong is when he didn't have anyone else around him to encourage him, um, you know, he, he learned to strengthen himself in the Lord. He learned that when he was out on, you know, just minding his own business, working in the field, with with the sheep, he would he would pray and sing and sing psalms to, to to the Lord, sing psalms about his about what God meant to him, and he just stirred himself up. He didn't have a priest or a prophet around him. He just had him and his own spirit, and that was that was what he needed, and it's and it, it strengthened him in his call. It set his course for a place of strength. It set his course, and so. Uh, John, he was on the Isle of Patmos. He says in the book of Revelation, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Again, no, he, he, I don't know if he, he even had any scripture. Um, I don't know if he had any, any uh, worship music. There was no, no YouTube, no minstrels around him. All he had was he was on a, a deserted island, and he had, all he had was his, his spirit, his voice, his vision, his memories, and he just stirred himself up. He just stirred himself up. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Isn't that awesome? And so you have to stay in this place of strength. So again, just to recap, there's two aspects of this place of strength. Your position, knowing your position. And number two, knowing your flow. Knowing the flow of, 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 the, flow of the spirit inside you. Learning how to stir, stir yourself up, whether it's getting into an environment where your gifts are stirred up um, or else or else learning how to start up yourself where you don't have anything but you, your spirit, the word of God inside of you, and learning how to store that up. No training wheels. Just you riding, riding your own spiritual bikes. So when you're in the place of strength, you can, you can overcome, you can survive, uh, you, can, you can survive attack, a temptation. You are in that place of advantage. The enemy has no advantage over you. You've got to keep your advantage at all times. Always keep your advantage. You have to stay in that place of strength to recognize uh, and obey an opportunity that God gives you. There's good works God's prepared for you to walk in. And if you're not positioned in the right way, whoosh, sometimes they just go right over your head. Like this, this thought like, oh, that's interesting. I, I, someone else can do that. There's no in, nothing inside that like, I'm ready. Uh, I was born for this. You know, that, that, that attitude is not there. But we need to have this. When you're in the right position, like, I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have that, that mindset. Because God's prepared good works for you to walk in. And you have to be ready. So uh, when an opportunity comes, are we ready? Do we have that place of strength? Um, instead of fear gripping us, or, um, or is preparedness uh, holding on to us? This I can do it. Does that rise up inside of us? So we have to stay in this place of strength so we're ready when people need us. The only way to survive the riptides of life is if you're out of the riptide. Don't lose your position. It's not about being tough. Yeah, I can handle it. I'm tough enough. It's not weakness to stay in a place of strength. It's like, you know what? I can't do that. I, I get in a place of weakness if, if, I'm, if I'm doing that behavior, if I'm in that mindset. 
I, I, I get weak if I'm like that. It's not weakness to acknowledge where you become weak. Don't try to be the tough guy. Don't try and be the, the, the tough person. Stop. Stand in your place of your, of your position. Get back into your place where you're strong. When you're strong, then you can do it. Sometimes you just need to, you're, you, I'm in this right now. Sometimes you're in a place where you are, you're meant to uh, solve this problem and all these pressures are on you to solve it. But you're not strong where you need to be. You just need to hold, get into that place of, of strength. Know who you are. Don't try and do before you're in the right place. Because if you try and do, you'll be like Saul. Uh, you remember Saul when the people were pressuring him to make a sacrifice and he had to wait for the right, right person in the right position to do, do the right thing for Samuel to get there and Samuel seemed to be late. And, and so Saul was like, I'm just going to do it myself. And because he acted at the raw, at impatiently, he lost the kingdom. It was torn from him. So in the same way, if we act impatiently without being in the right position, the right place with God, taking the time to pray, taking the time to meditate, taking the time to, again, get in that, that position, that mindset of getting that flow, that, 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 that flow of God, the flow of the Spirit. I'll close with this. When I was in Malaysia, um, one of the, the, the ministers I was with, Dr. Jonathan David, he, uh, he positioned their, their um, prayer nights in a certain way. He says, um, and he, he said, well, if we're going to pray for big things, let's set the atmosphere. He says, let's really get the high praise of God going. Let's, if we're going to attack big things, let's get a vision of a, of a big God our position in him and so they they get the praise up they get the worship going they get all these things up before they uh, dealt, dealt with the problem they got secure in their position and so before we and and again when when the worship is at the highest when the, the praise is at the highest when the atmosphere is saturated with the presence of god then that's when they took hold of that that problem and that said all right God, this is the problem. And at that point, the problem seemed always that small. It's like, oh, this is the thing we're going to attack. And then they took that thing and they ground it up. They ground it up by faith, by prayer, by the spirit. And they would win a victory. They would always win a victory. So that's what I want to leave you guys with today. So I thank you guys for listening. I know it's a little bit longer here. But I, again, I really, I, I love you guys. I bless you guys. Um, come visit us here on and, and, uh, at our church on Turner Avenue, uh, we we here on Sundays, um, uh, starting at, at ten o'clock. Get here a little bit early. Talk with some people. We love you. We bless you. And again, um, we look forward to seeing you. Bless you.